Assalamualaikum. Okay. Uh, Assalamualaikum and very good morning. Okay. So um, I would like to welcome everyone. Okay, to the session 2A. Okay, I'm Dr. Samia Jama binti Makrosi from Universiti Sultan Zainal Abidin, the chairperson for the sessions. Okay, as the chairperson, I will be moderating this whole sessions. So we are looking forward to listen to the prominent speaker today presenting their work okay, at this conference. Okay, so I hope that we shall have a fruitful session today. So before we get uh, started, can I um, okay, check for the speaker if everyone is here. Okay, so we have uh, Prof. Dr. Abdul Halim. So um, our first speaker, Dr. Noh Hedawati Kasim. Siti Nurul Falain, okay. Uh, Doctor Ainu, she's not here. Doctor Ainu, okay, maybe she's not here. And Miss Noraini, okay. And last, our speaker is Miss Nor Ainabila. So uh, we are waiting for the <coughs> Dr. Aino, so maybe we can proceed for the, our sessions. Okay. So here is a little reminder to all the speaker, okay, regarding the timing. Okay, so each presenter is scheduled for 10 minutes presentations and five minute Q and A. Okay, the first ball, uh, sorry, the first bell okay, will ring at eight minutes, the second bell at the ten minutes, and the third bell we will ring at the fifteen minutes. Okay. So I introduce our co-chairperson today is Dr. Wee. Okay. Okay. So without any delay, okay. First, I would like to invite the invited speaker for this sessions. Okay. okay Prof. Dr. Abdul Halim Shaari from the UPM. Okay. Um, to uh, from the UPM to deliver his presentations. So entitled. Some aspect of material characterization using electron spin resonant ESR spectroscopy. So please welcome. Okay, for the introduction, so Prof. Dr. Abdul Halim Shaari is a professor in the Faculty of Science UPM. So his research concentrated in the core area of physics, glass ceramics, and advanced optical material. So his current research interest in the interplay between magnetism and superconductivity. Magnetic or superconducting material are prepared in bulk form with the appropriate doping, addition or substitution to see the interplay behavior. It can also be in thin heterogeneous film or multilayer film prepared via PLD or sputtering method. So another research area is in the multi-ferroelectric material. So again, the interest is in the coexistence of the ferroelectric and ferromagnetic behavior. So without delay, so... Uh, I give to the Prof. Dr. Abdul Halim for the speaking. Thank you. Uh, <coughs> Assalamualaikum and good morning. Yeah. So uh, I'm happy because uh, I don't have many audience. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't. I like when there is not many audience uh, because. Uh, well, I've mentioned to Dato Roslan, don't ask many questions because last time we had Teh Tari after the, after the uh, dinner yeah, until 12 uh, midnight. So when I went back to the room, my room, I thought I want to find what is uh, the material that I, I want to present uh, this morning. I couldn't find. Okay? And then, Tido, pagi, bangun, pergi makan, apa nak buat? Cari-cari adalah sikit. Okay. So uh, maybe I just, I'm going to present this a little bit on uh, a technique in, uh, in, uh, in <coughs> doing research. In doing research, of course, first you have to prepare your sample. There are many techniques of preparing sample. Okay. 
Last time I used to talk about techniques in preparation of samples. But after preparing your sample, what is your first tool? Your first tool is X-ray, okay? You find X-ray and say you characterize your, what your the structure of your samples and so on. And besides that, then after that, you you search for tools which are related to some properties that uh, belong to your samples. Eh? Maybe optical properties, magnetic properties, uh, superconducting properties, and so on. Okay? So there are many, many, many uh, techniques. Okay? So one of the techniques is uh, uh, electron spin resonance. Okay? Another, the, the, uh, sometimes they call EPR, right? parametric uh, resonance. Okay? It's the same thing. Okay? It's the resonance of the uh, of the spin. Okay? And of maybe some of you are familiar with NMR, nuclear magnetic resonance. Okay? I think the chemists are very familiar. Those people working on natural products, they want to find the, the structures and so on. So they, they use uh, uh, um, NMR. Okay? So all of you are familiar with NMR, I think. Okay? Uh, but I want to talk a little bit because uh, ESR, not many, we have, a, we have a unit in our de department. Okay? Uh, even then, not, not, not many users. Yeah? Uh, because it's very specific with this technique. Uh, with this technique, uh, you are talking about. Uh, yeah? with, uh, with this technique, you are concerned about the. Uh, the, the Electrons which are unpaired. You know, electrons, if you look at your atom, in the, uh, the structure of your atom, you have nucleus, and then outside, uh, you have the uh, electrons outside uh, uh, occupying uh, different types of uh, orbits with uh, different energy uh, 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 energies. Yeah? And then, uh, and then you, uh, it is uh, governed by the rules that uh, how many electrons should be in this. Yeah? SPDF uh, shell. Eh? Uh, so there are some shells which have no pair, no pairing. Pairing is uh, pairing in terms of spins. The last, you know, the electron, you have uh, four um, uh, to, to, to uh, differentiate electron, means you have to look at the principal quantum number, all the four quantums eh? orbital, uh, magnetic, and spin. The last is spin. Chaotic, if that all these three are the same, then the last one, that electron must be different in terms of spin, because otherwise they cannot, they violate the, the rules, eh? the rules of occupation. You cannot have, um, uh, you see, uh, to be pairing means you have to, to have spin up and down, spin up, spin down one pair. So you cannot have a pair, spin up, up, you need the LGBT. LGBT, there's no LGBT with electrons, eh? Electron. <laughs> uh, so, okay, so I check up my is about boss, but I don't have much to, to show you. <laughs> so, I digress a little bit. Yeah. So, this, okay, let, let's, let us see this about the electrons which are unpaired. So, this technique is, uh, is able to detect the unpaired electrons in the system. When you have unpaired electrons, it will give a but it resonates at a certain uh, energy, yeah? and it will give you some input uh, about, the, uh, about the properties of your sample. And that input is, is uh, normally we look input we look for um, call this uh, as, as, a, as a fingerprint. Fingerprint. Same thing when you do X-ray, you also. The, uh, some of the <coughs> signals are a, a fingerprint of that particular material. Okay? You do FTIR, some of you are. That is the, maybe at the point where absorption is based on what, uh, what molecules and so on. Okay? So we are looking for fingerprint when we do, when we try samples. Okay? So here also, uh, when, the, when the sample have a different uh, uh, electron, how many electron packs are there? Yeah? How, how many electron uh, we are not concerned about electron pairing. We are concerned about unpaired electrons. Okay? Because it has a spin has some properties that can 
respond uh, to a certain environment. The, env the environment that we are going to use here is a uh, magnetic field. Yeah? Where I'm sure in some of you may, may have heard about Zeeman effect. Yeah? Zeeman effect. Uh, so we are talking about Zeeman effect uh, in, in this case. Yeah? So, okay, 32. Uh, so you can see that uh, I'll just talk a little bit on, I'm not going to talk all about this. Um, you can see the, the, uh, the electrons, the, the ladies there, yeah? Uh, you can see here, one of the punya ni, yeah? Laser. Go. So laser. Laser. On, 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 on. Tak apa. Hah? Oh, ke, ke mana? Oh, sini, okey tu. Takut dia ada unpacked elektron ni. This abstract is, uh, yes, I, I send this abstract to, to, this, uh, co uh, to this conference, eh? but uh, I don't have a lot of the content because I couldn't find last night. But I will, I will try to elaborate a little bit of what this, uh, this is um, a study of material which we think have uh, electron, electron pad. Eh? And this has been done at our department, yeah? For example, like a YBCO, yeah? uh, substituted by uh, potassium at barium sites, and then you have uh, uh, bismuth ferrites. And I don't know how many of you are working on bismuth ferrite nanoparticle, bismuth ferrite, doped with uh, uh, oxide, yeah? Uh, this is a composite, so we have... Uh, uh, nanoparticle of lanthanum strontium manganite, which are the magnetoresistive material, yeah? and also the, uh, the zinc selenite nanocrystals. These are more towards uh, semiconductors. Yeah? So, uh, uh, said that it was reported that the uh, ESR, the spin uh, electron spin resonance, uh, uh, there is a, uh, it shows the splitting of two components and then shifted. So these are all the, the result of what we have done by, by the researchers in our group. Yeah. So let's say, um, okay, this is a spin resonant. Yeah. Sometimes they call it EPR. Uh, this talking about study. Uh, spectroscopy is a, is a method for studying material with unpacked electrons. Yeah. So how many, how many are there? Yeah. Uh, the basic concept, uh, Analogous and similar to NMR. So all this here, yeah? I want to read everything. So here, you can see. You can see these ladies. The, this is when no magnet. This is when the magnetic field is zero. So when you apply magnet, you find that uh, some of the spins will absorb the energy from the, from the microwave. The, the, the probe is microwave. Uh, so the probe. And then it will be uh, <clears throat> excited to uh, an energy level. Yeah? So that, that's uh, what, what, what is happening in the, uh, in the material. So of course, this is a theory I don't want to bore you with. All. These are the basic theories you're talking about. When you have an external field, in the presence of external magnetic field with, uh, with a certain strength, so then uh, you have this uh, um, 
the 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 the, 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 the Zeeman effect. Yeah? The Zeeman effect is given by this delta E is the the, um, the energy between the uh, between the two energy level, which split in the presence of magnetic field. If there is no magnetic field, so there is no splitting of the energy level. Yeah? So it, uh, spin will be will be in the in the uh, lowest energy states. Yeah? So this is what happened, yeah. So at a certain, at a certain, at a certain uh, value of the field, it resonates because that energy, the difference between the two, uh, the two uh, uh, energy states, is equal to the energy provided by the um, by the um, uh, mi microwave. Yeah, microwave. Okay, you see, uh, in spectroscopy, you must have uh, a probe. The probe can be X-rays, microwave, uh, uh, electron wave, and um, uh, light, yeah? uh, gamma rays, uh, many. All those uh, can become the probe. So here, the probe is uh, microwave, and uh, the samples are in the environment of magnetic, uh, magnetic field. Then, if there are uh, the presence of many um, electrons, uh, uh, unpaired electron, you have some certain signal, certain signal. Yeah? Okay. So the uh, the experiment is simple. You take the sample, you put into the magnetic field. I mean, uh, you have a magnetic field. Take the sample, put into the magnetic field. Then you irradiate with microwave frequencies. You irradiate with microwave frequencies. The microwave frequency will carry with it energy. And that energy is, is, is absorbed by the, uh, by the uh, electrons, eh? absorbed by the electron. And a certain, certain, temp uh, certain um, value of the field, when the, the input energy is equal to the energy of uh, the, uh, the, the difference between the, the two levels, then there is, it will resonate. Eh? Resonance will, so they call it a resonant field. Eh? Resonant field. So we, at a certain value of the field, it will resonate. Misalnya yeah? kalau kita ambil kaca tu gelas, eh? letak air sikit, pusing dekat muka dia tu, sampai satu ketika, you akan dengar sound. Yeah? It resonates. Yeah? Contoh mudah lah itu. Yeah? And this is what happened. Um, you have a zero field. Zero field. Uh, these, the spins are random. Yeah? And then you have a Zeeman splitting. The, the Zeeman splitting when it is placed in the field. After Zeeman splitting, you pass the, the um, microwave. Then it will absorb, it will resonate. Once it resonates, it will go up to the highest energy level. After that, it won't be there for long. It will come down. It will, it will relax. So resonance naik atas, relaxation turun bawah. So this is uh, happening yeah, in the system. So what do you do is, uh, this is a uh, nuclear and uh, the relationship between the Zeeman effect in, in, uh, in, in the ESR. So you have also the uh, nuclear, nuclear spin states which are in the NMR. I don't to go there. And these are some theory. Yeah? We need to use some theory here because uh, unpaired electrons uh, uh, will be subjected to this uh, Zeeman interaction yeah? and, and so on. So you have the, uh, the, finally you have the energy here, yeah? this, uh, this energy. So we are going to measure all this uh, uh, in the, in the spectro, spectrometer. Yeah? In a brief theory, I don't want to go. Uh, this is a system, yeah? electro uh, ESR, yang kita, yang kita ada, yeah? a spectro, uh, a spectro photometer. So the working principle is that you have uh, to, you, have, you must have a source of microwave coming from crystal oscillator. You oscillate, they clock on uh, microwave, and then after 
passing through some isolator and so on, uh, uh, you pass the microwave to the, to the sample. Yeah? And then you, have, you can see here um, the peak, absorption peak. Sama juga macam dalam dalam in the in, in the um, FTIR, when you pass your uh, electromagnetic radiation, it will be absorbed. Yeah? You will absorb uh, uh, the. I mean the FTIR. You 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 send in the infrared signal. Yeah, that is absorbed by the sample. As different uh, functional group will. We absorb differently, so it becomes the finger, uh, the fingerprint. Yeah? Mm -hmm. And then, if you look at the curve absorption, is just like the, the front one absorption curve. That absorption curve is not that good, but you have to use mathematics to find the first deriv derivative. You what dy dx, yeah? uh, dy dx, so you get the first derivative. If you Differentiate further, you have second derivative and so on. So here is good. When you buy the machine, the machine will tell you that the absorption peak is now converted to uh, uh, the first derivative. Then from there, you can do the analysis. So let's see how. Uh, that's uh, um, with the help of, of, of uh, differentiation of the, of the absorption peak. This is what happened. The presentation of the spectrum, uh, the absorption peak. And this is the, the first derivative, dy dx, you get that curve. So we are now going to look at that particular response. So you have absorbance, then you have a first derivative. Then expansion of magnetic field, magnetic field. And that's a signal that you get, a signal of the the presence of um, unpacked electrons. Yeah. So this again, yeah. um, detection of the derivative of absorption spectrum yeah, by field modulation and so on. These are um, very technical. Now, yeah. uh, so as, uh, as usual, you have to have a, a standard, some, some standard to compare. First, you have a standard to show that uh, it's just like cali calibration. Yeah? Now, all your equipment must be calibrated. Yeah? It must be calibrated. So you have a standard sample. Yeah? And in Melbourne, uh, you have to use uh, uh, a standard sample as a, to calibrate how good is your, your equipment. Yeah? It's a must now. Yeah? Otherwise, you will get the wrong signal. Yeah? So the... the uh, this is uh, standard, uh, this material is standard. When you buy your equipment, uh, you have to buy this so that when you do an experiment, you put your, uh, this standard sample in one uh, uh, place and then uh, your sample in another side by side and then you uh, subject to the microwave uh, radiation, irradiation. Uh, this is uh, some calculation of how to get the, the value of the, uh, the Bohr magneton. Uh, this is another... Uh, factors about uh, the electron, eh? properties of the electrons. So you can determine determination of G value. Eh? The best method of measurement of G value is to measure the field separation and so on. Yeah? Uh, and then you compare to the reference substance uh, G value eh? uh, known. Eh? known as, uh, so DDPH is uh, generally a standard whose value is that. So you compare to that. Yeah? When you compare to that. That means uh, uh, something is happening to your sample. Yeah? Uh, because this uh, uh, G value is, uh, will refer to the properties of your unpacked electrons. Yeah? So application here, yeah, you can uh, study the free, free radical. You have free radical? radical? A lot of free radical. You want to see how, how many... Uh, the, the degree of uh, the presence of free radical, you can use this technique because of the presence of unpaired electron. That's so how you have a, otherwise, it's, it's not a radical. If, if your electrons are all paired, they tak mau lah, they tak mau ambil tindak lah. This is just the radical. So, uh, you see, 
this spectroscopy. The structure of organic inorganic free radical can be identified in investigation molecules in the triplet state. This is a lot of uh, uh, we call this um, state of the molecule here. Yeah? This is the, 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 the splitting state. Yeah? You can have a uh, Zeeman splitting, then you can have a uh, hyper fine, hyper fine splitting. Yeah? He thought, uh, I'm not going to uh, talk about hyper fine because that, that's, uh, we have not, I think those people are working with uh, large molecules, yeah? uh, in the ke especially chemistry. Yeah? You can use uh, hyper fine. Yeah? So uh, you can use to study a structural determination, the structure. Yeah? In some cases, it also provides information about the shape of the radical. Yeah? Then you have reaction, velocity, inorganic, and so on, analytical application, uh, biological application, the presence of free radical in healthy and disease conditions. I don't know whether this can be used to uh, study COVID-19. I don't know. Yeah? Functioning of most of the alternative enzyme can be con uh, uh, conform or confirmed. Yeah? And these are some of the um, uh, basic properties that you have to know. We are talking about um, um, the G value, which is related to the properties of the electron. Eh? Yeah. The speed of it coupling, all this, um, uh, you need uh, maybe a one or two hour lecture. Eh? So never mind. But we know that we are looking at the properties, the basic properties of single uh, electron, uh, electron um, unpacked electrons. So that is when you uh, signal. So that is now when you depend on the position of your the orientation of your sample, yeah? and so on. Yeah? So all this uh, are telling you uh, if you have this one, yeah? the field and the direction of the uh, orbit, the spin orbit coupling will give you uh, different uh, position of the of the. Uh, um, the distance uh, or the G values, yeah? G values. What happens if the crystal is ground into powders? Then you have this. So you can see for powder, you get that kind of uh, signal. For um, crystal, you get a uh, different signal. Sometimes uh, the orientation of signal and isotropy, you, can have, you have a different, different uh, the, the signal of the first derivative is different. So this, uh, this, all this from here, you can can get some information. Yeah? You can see here, uh, this uh, you are looking into the um, the um, the shift, yeah? the phase shift between x and z orientation, yeah? x y z orientation. And again, yeah, talking about isotropic versus and uh, and isotropic spectra. Still, with this um, uh, the behavior of spin uh, unpacked electron, you can see the the position of Sometimes G factor, yeah, the gyration of the yeah, electrons. Yeah. Okay, this is one result that we have done yeah, with by, I think, uh, by this, our group. Yeah. We present in the, well, not a good journal, but it's a journal. <laughs> so, uh, so this, this is what happened. You can see the signal there. Uh, all those signals are actually... Um, uh, the first derivative Sorry, of the absorption and so on. Sorry, yeah? Trump, so you have five minute more? Okay. Uh, this one is, uh, I, I just show how many work that we have done. I'm not going to uh, de describe. This is one work that we have done. We have published there. You're seeing this. And then uh, this is the same. I just elaborate on the how. Uh, this is another work. Yeah? This is on poly uh, published in Polymer. Uh, this uh, on the semiconductor, yeah? cadmium oxide semiconductor, nanoparticle. Yeah? You can see there, uh, different uh, PVP. We, um, the method is um, using uh, PVP as the uh, capping agent. I don't know whether you have heard of capping agent. Next, uh, this is on the here, nanoparticle synthesized uh, using thermal treatment method. Yeah? This is uh, another work. We sent to Malaysia, Malaysia eh, Dato. <laughs> so, uh, so we can get all this uh, uh, the ESR uh, spectra eh, and so on. The same thing. 
the, this is the effect of calcination on the uh, uh, magneto-resistant material. Yeah? You can see also how different, yeah? as you uh, uh, increase the temperature from room temperature, you can see that there is a de de deviation of the, of the signal coming from uh, 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 unpacked electrons. Yeah? This is another, yeah, this is another one, yeah. So in simple preparation and conservation of bismuth, ferrites, you know, particularly by the steel thermal method, but now you want to see how different is it uh, uh, as a function of, uh, uh, as a function of temperature, yeah, yeah tem the temperatures. Uh, this is again, this is for different material, this is for another group, yeah. Uh, this is a semiconductor, eh? cadmium, zinc, uh, selenite. I think it's Prof. Zainal eh? working in that. You can see the presence of iron. Yeah? Uh, uh, you can see the, this is the, um, some effect of uh, uh, spin concentration versus milling time. Yeah? So you mill, when you mill, you can see whether there's any the impurities in your sample. You can see that. And this is uh, YBCO, you dope with potassium. Um, yeah. then you can see here, Ceramic International, of course, a long uh, discussion, a long uh, uh, discussion. But still, again, uh, all these G factors here uh, is referred to the properties given by the unpacked electrons. Yeah. So this one, this, uh, this is another one, yeah. It's the same thing, yeah. And this is, uh, yes, another work uh, done by Josephine and the group. Cadmium yeah. zinc selenite, nano, nano crystal. Yeah. You can see the, the first derivative is changing as a function of temperature. So how are you going to, to uh, now the, uh, the how, to, how to get information from that kind of, uh, that kind of um, output? Yeah. And this is another one. Uh, this is a semiconductor nickel nickel oxide, eh? nickel oxide semiconductor. So I think uh, then, then uh, hyperfine splitting. Uh, this, I'm not going to discuss this because this uh, uh, it will take another hour eh? or more. Eh? So I think uh, I stop there. Eh? So uh, we just use. Uh, uh, ESR spectrometer to study uh, the properties of unpaired electrons uh, in the Zeeman uh, splitting effect. We do not go to the hyperfine structure. It's just a basic structure. Yeah? So uh, with, uh, with that, I thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Prof. Okay, now I shall open for floor for any questions. Maybe we can allow for one question. All clear. All clear, good. Okay. All understand? Okay. So if um, <clears throat> okay, if uh, no questions, okay, I would like to thank you, the prof. Okay, and uh, now I will uh, deliver the certificate for the prof. So now I would like to welcome our next speaker, okay, um, Dr. Nor Hedawati Kasim from the University Pertahanan National Malaysia that will represent potential of kappa carrageenan as additive for improving permeability of mixed matrix membranes. Please welcome. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Uh, 
Okay, uh, assalamualaikum and good morning to everyone. Uh, thank you to the chairperson. I am Herdawati from University Pertahanan National Malaysia. So actually today I would like to share uh, our finding uh, from uh, our research team. Uh, so the sharing topic today is potential of uh, kappa carrageenan as additive in improving permeability of mixed matrix membranes. Okay, so uh, basically this is uh, the outline for my sharing session today. Okay, let me start a bit uh, with a brief introduction uh, about uh, polysulfone membranes for water treatment. Okay, so here, in this figure here, it shows a basic principle of a membrane separation. So actually, a membrane acts as a filter. Uh, so for our, uh, our research, we are uh, studying to remove uh, heavy metals uh, that consist uh, in groundwater. Uh, so, membrane technology is actually effective in water treatment to remove toxic components and at the same time also can recover essential uh, elements from industrial effluent. Um, okay, so uh, polysulfone is actually one of the polymer used uh, in porous, uh, in producing porous membranes. And most uh, research uh, normally focus on high performance of water or wastewater uh, treatment by using hydrophilic membranes. Uh, and also polymers or hydrophilic addi uh, additives. Okay, um, so why do we choose a polysulfone? Uh, actually, this is uh, due to uh, it has uh, excellent mechanical uh, qualities, uh, and then it is uh, mechanically uh, due to the mechanical strength, and also uh, based on the thermal stability. And polysulfone can be uh, operate uh, in a wide range of temperature and also pH. And then, but then the drawback of a polysulfone is actually it is too hydrophobic, uh, which can cause membrane fouling. Uh, so therefore, this can reduce uh, the membrane lifespan. Um, in order to overcome polysulfone limitation, so therefore we choose uh, to have a physical bending uh, because of uh, it is sim it is simple uh, and then uh, low cost. And most uh, importantly, uh, it is able to maintain the membrane's fundamental morphology. All right, uh, so towards uh, producing biopolymer-based membranes, so we are exploring uh, the blending of uh, kappa carrageenan. Uh, actually, kappa carrageenan is a red seaweed uh, biopolymer with gelling, emulsifying, and also stabilizing properties. Uh, it has been reported uh, from other researchers. Uh, this uh, kappa carrageenan has uh, ability uh, to produce a highly porous membrane. All right. Uh, so here, uh, this is the uh, anionic structure of kappa carrageenan. So kappa carrageenan is actually one of the natural biopolymers. Uh, so this biopolymer are hydrophilic. It is known hydrophilic, uh, which can improve uh, membranes falling resistant and also water permeability. So by this development on hydrophilic membranes, so we are expecting uh, to overcome uh, membrane fouling. All right, so due to the problem statement whereby uh, because of a, a fouling that normally caused by membranes and due to the hydrophobic nature of polysulfone, which can cause poor quality of the filtrate and also uh, reduce, uh, reduce the lifespan. So therefore, uh, the solution is we want to blend the kappa carrageenan together with the polysulfone in order for us to uh, produce nanocomposite flat sheet membrane. All right, uh, so uh, the research aim of our work, um, due to the hydrophobic nature of polysulfone, so normally uh, the water flux will be dropped. Okay, so uh, we, are, we are focusing on uh, studying to remove heavy metals in groundwater, for example, iron, manganese, uh, chromium, also arsenic. So therefore, the motivation of our work is actually to fabricate hydrophilic membranes with high capability in removing this kind of heavy metals. All right, so the flow chart here shows the, our research activities. So we start with uh, preparing the membrane. Uh, 
Okay, and then uh, the, the prepared membrane or the fabricated membrane uh, will go for membrane characterization. Uh, so mainly, the, uh, we want to check the permeability, hydrophilicity, the surface morphology, and also the surface charge. So here, um, this is uh, the bench scale filtration setup in our lab. So to study the performance of uh, our membrane, the fabricated membrane, so we use a dead end, uh, dead end stirred cell. All right. So basically, this is the uh, steps huh, to prepare the casting solution in order for us to uh, fabricate the membrane. Okay. So uh, basically, we need to prepare the materials uh, whereby we have kappa carrageenan and also the polysulfuresin. Uh, so we, prep, uh, we prepare it at an uh, appropriate uh, percentage ratio. So this is a few uh, figures. Uh, this is what we do in our lab. Okay. So uh, in order for us to prepare the membrane, to fabricate the membrane, normally it takes uh, more than one day because we have to prepare the casting solution first and leave it overnight. And then the next day, then only we can, uh, we can fabricate the membranes. All right, so this is basically the step of uh, casting the membrane. So the prepared, uh, the prepared casting solution that we have uh, prepared uh, the, the, the day earlier, uh, so what we need to do is pour the casting solution on a clean glass and then we adjust the desired thickness that required. Uh, for our study, uh, we fix the thickness at 0 0.2 millimeter. And then we have a casting blade holder here. So basically, uh, the membrane that we prepare, it is actually manually prepared. Okay, and then uh, it is soaked in the, uh, the it is soaked in a water bath. So this step, uh, this method, uh, we call it a uh, wet phase uh, inversion method. Okay. Uh, so uh, in terms of our findings, um, so the prepared uh, casting solution. Okay, so actually, um, uh, this is more to the preliminary work. So we have a few samples here, um, membrane M01 to M05. So M01 is uh, actually pure polysulfone membrane, whereby we don't add uh, any carrageenan. Um, okay, and then the rest uh, over here um, is a membrane formulation. So... Um, uh, basically, what we can see here is uh, the viscosity of the casting solution, for sure, increased uh, by the addition of the kappa carrageenan to the polymeric uh, casting solution. Okay, so this is, uh, this is actually not uh, a FISEM images. So what we show here is uh, images that we capture by using a high-end uh, camera. Okay, so... This four membrane uh, is uh, those fabricated membrane that we uh, blend together with kappa carrageenan. So the percentage is about 0.1 to 1%. So what we can see here, uh, by increasing the percentage of kappa carrageenan, so we can see uh, uh, it is uh, more, more pores on the membranes. Okay. All right, so on the performance test, what we do, we check the water flux, uh, uh, pure water flux study. So uh, as what we can see here, of course, for sure, the water flux uh, uh, is increasing. In comparison to pure polysulfone, M01, the water flux is very low. By adding a small amount of a kappa carrageenan, so uh, the percentage of kappa carrageenan uh, significantly uh, increase the water uptake of the fabricated membrane. Okay, so here is the um, uh, results huh, from a water contact angle test. This is actually to, to study and to, to check the hydrophilicity and also permeability analysis. So what we can see here in comparison to a pure polysulfone membrane, the uh, water contact angle is uh, quite high, eh? 68.5. And then by adding a kappa carrageenan, so it seems like uh, the hydrophilicity of the membrane is increased. But then we are still uh, investigating what happened with the membrane of M04. Okay? All right, uh, so this is uh, FISEM images. 
uh, this is just to show and compare with the uh, pure polysulfur membranes and also, and also the membrane that we add uh, uh, kapaka region. And so basically, uh, we still have a uh, finger-like uh, structure of the membrane. Um, but then um, we are about to check uh, the porosity and then will be uh, presented in next uh, coming conference, maybe. Okay, so uh, as conclusion, by addition of small amount of kapaka reginin, especially 0.1 and 0.25% uh, by weight, can increase the water flux significantly and also improve the membrane's uh, hydrophilicity. So by blending with kapaka reginin, it has improved the porosity, but but then uh, reduce the mechanical strength of fabricated membranes uh, as increasing of the kapaka reginin make the membrane become brittle and then easily tear. Okay, for future plan, we are planning to embed with silver nanoparticle, which is expected to form membranes with antimicrobial properties. So I think that's all from me. Thank you very much. Okay, th okay thank you. So now I open the questions. They have five questions. Thank you. Uh, I have one question. Uh, since I is a hydrophilic, uh, would it uh, swelling when you uh, place it in the filter? Um, okay. D uh, due to the hydrophilicity of the membrane. Okay. Yes. Would it swell, which may expand it when uh, in contact with water for in long time? Uh, yeah, I think, uh, okay, uh, thank you very much for the question. Uh, currently, we are still studying the effect of adding a uh, uh, high amount of kappa carrageenan, so that's why we go for uh, uh, little, I mean, uh, amount of kappa carrageenan. Uh, so far, we didn't check yet in, term, uh, in terms of time. Uh, whether uh, is it uh, possible to make the membrane uh, swell, but then uh, I think this is my opinion since uh, the percentage of uh, polysulfone is still the major percentage. So most probably uh, we, we think that uh, the swelling problem might be, um, it didn't cause any swelling problem yet. But then, yes, uh, we can take into our consideration to check whether uh, in a longer period, uh, whether it is possible to have that problem. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, uh, thank you. So, any more questions? Okay, um, I have... Uh, yeah. Okay. Membrane. Ah, yeah, membrane. Oh, membrane. Prof. Thin film. Oh, thin film membrane. Uh -huh. And going to be used for what? what, what, what application? Uh, the application is uh, for water, water industry. Yes, water treatment. So Mainly groundwater treatment. Sometimes they have this, um, the, the possibility of uh, fouling. fouling yeah, of fouling. fouling. Betul. Ah, betul. So how, so how, how uh, can uh, fouling is due to maybe. Yes big particles coming down uh -huh. and so on. So how, how does, uh, I mean, the, you, this, this uh, Membrane. membranes help okay. in avoiding or reduce the, uh, the effect of, uh, of fouling? Fouling, okay. All right, thank you very much, Prof. Okay, uh, when we talk about membrane, so fouling is normally, I can say, is a mass related to a membrane. So uh, actually for membrane, uh, there are two mechanisms. Uh, one is sieving effect and another one is donant effect. Sieving, is, uh, sieving effect is mainly due to the size of particle that we want to remove. But then the donant effect, especially when we relate, uh, relate to the ionic solutes, uh, because we, uh, we cannot really measure the size of the ionic solutes. So therefore, we, go, uh, I mean, uh, we discover that it is more to the donant effect. So uh, basically, uh, in terms of to reduce fouling, so in water industries, uh, normally uh, at certain time, uh, they do backwash. Uh, to, uh, so therefore, we can uh, expand the lifespan of the membrane. Is it clear, Prof? Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you. Dr. Nohidawati. 
Okay, so now I call the, our second uh, speaker, Siti Nur Falain Binti Moridon from the University Kebangsaan Malaysia will present a coral-like molybdenum carbon TiO2 composite heterojunction photoelectrode for photoelectrochemical water splitting application. Please welcome. Uh, Assalamualaikum and good, very good morning to everyone. Uh, my name is Siti Nurul Falain Binti Moridun from Fusel Institute University Kebangsaan Malaysia. Today I will present my preliminary study about a coral light moridun carbide with TiO2 composite hydrojunction photoelectrode for photoelectrochemical photo water splitting. Okay, as an introduction, uh, as the world uh, Fossil fuel is the main energy source of the world today. So as the world population increase, it's caused the uh, pollution, especially in the em increasing emitting of carbon dioxide. So an alternative and renewable energy is required to replace the non-renewable energy. So hydrogen is the most abundant element in the earth that possi possible as the uh, replacement of the uh, fossil fuel. Hydrogen is a sustainable and clean energy carrier that when consumed in fossil fuel cell produce only water, electricity and heat depending on the method of production. There's a lot of method of production of hydrogen. However, today I will focus on the method of production solar water splitting through photoelectrochemical water splitting. So, uh, as a background study, uh, TiO2 uh, has been found by Fujishima and Honda in 1972 uh, as a photocatalyst in the fo splitting water molecule into hydrogen and oxygen. So, uh, until now, uh, titanium dioxide still the most de desirable and uh, studied material due to the advantages of stable, low cost and environmental friendly. However, there are some limitation of TiO2 such as white band gap and limitation of absorption of light uh, because the absorption of uh, UV energy. So there is a lot of modification has been done by researchers such as metal ion doping, noble deposition, non-metal doping and co-doping. So today I will focus on the uh, composite hydrogen with the material of molybdenum carbide because molybdenum carbide is the high electrical conductivity material and electronic density state and also a low cost alternative material. S to overcome the problem which is TiO2 has a wide band gap and the low sensitivity to visible light. So the objective of this study is to analyze the impact of molybdenum carbide content on the photocatalyst activity of the modern carbide with TiO2 catalyst. So this is the method of synthesis that has been done, uh, which is uh, measuring the weight of uh, commercialized TiO2 and modern carbide uh, to produce 1, 2, 3 and 4 percent weight percent of modern carbide with TiO2 and then mix with ethanol and polyethylene glycol and then uh, uh, still we using magnetic zero for 30 minutes and then uh, the resulting mixture was transferred onto the FTO using the spin coating technique and then the prepared sample was annealed in the air at the 400 degrees Celsius for one hour. Then the prepared sample was categorized using SRD, VSAM, EDX mapping, UVVs and linear scan voltammetry. Okay, next is this... Uh, uh, I analyzed the crystal structure using the SRD. So as we can see from figure one, uh, figure one A show the TiO2 has uh, show the phase of 210 and 230 are detected while in modium carbide, the phase of 002, 121, 022 and 130 are detected while when the 3% weight of modium carbide are uh, com composite with the TiO2 only one um, peak of molybdenum carbide are detected. They are because the lower content of the molybdenum carbide. Okay. Uh, next is the to confirm the existence of molybdenum carbide in the sample. Uh, I, uh, I run the EDX and mapping, and the EDX mapping show the present of the molybdenum carbide in the sample. So next is the morphology of the sample. From the figure 3a, we can see that uh, TiO2 shows a nanoparticle size with the average diameter 60.1 uh, 
one nanometer while modern carbide show mixture of long nano road and short clump road the most likely at the seat of molybdenum carbide growth with the average calculated length is 1.5 micrometer uh, after the loading of 3 weight percent of modern carbide onto the TiO2 demonstrate that modern carbide nano road was being covered by TiO2 and the overall morphology of 3 weight percent modern carbide TiO2 form a coral like structure Cool. So next, I measure the optical properties of the sample. TL2, uh, from the figure 4A, TL2 we should tend to absorb more UV light than visible. Uh, however, modern carbide has superior light absorption from the UV light to the IR. So the band gap value of 3 weight percent uh, modern carbide onto TL2 was determined with 1.1 uh, electron volt, which is lower than the pure TL2 and prove that composite heterojunction with modern carbide caused the band gap decrease. Okay, so this is the uh, photocatalyst activity uh, measurement. So based on the measurement, show that 3 weight percent has the greatest increase in the photocurrent density, which around 1.5 milliampere centimeter squared at a potential 1 voltage versus uh, AG, AGCL. So... This is the mechanism of the reaction uh, calculated using the Mott-Sotky and the uh, help of the UV vis from the band gap. So the band edge position of the L2 and molybdenum carbide clearly create type 1 heterojunction and this pathway significantly improves the pace which uh, electron hole uh, pair may be separated uh, which lead into the large increase of photocatalyst activity. Uh, based on this finding, the effective electron transfer in modium carbide and TL2 has been established in straightforward and convincing approach. So, as a conclusion, uh, we have able to prepare the composite heterojunction between modium carbide and TL2, and the coupling of TL2 and modium carbide, modium carbide can accelerate the interfacial transfer and separation of photogenerated charge carrier. Thank you. That's all. Okay, thank you. So I open the floor to questions. Yes. One questions. Uh, Assalamu alaikum. Uh, Dr. Jamal from UK. <coughs> A very nice talk. Uh, I have a few questions. Uh, one is regarding your crystal structure of. Uh, MO2 and TiO2. Uh, you, I, I'm wondering what was the crystal structure, I mean the phase of your TiO2 and uh, MO2. And, uh, the phase structure. Yeah. Based on SRD? Uh, yeah, whatever. I mean, uh, what is exactly the phase? I mean, the phase structure of TiO2. Yeah, it's yeah. an anatase structure. Uh, I'm sorry? Anatase. Oh, uh, I mean, what is, because you know, TiO2 have a lot of phases, so what is the role of your phase in, particularly in your device, because different phases play different roles? Uh, yeah. So, uh, this is because, this is a preliminary study of my study. Uh, there are some, as you can see from the XRD, there's a very low intensity of the peak. This is because I'm using the spin coating technique. That's because I have a thin layer of the sample. So uh, I've been uh, improved the method to improve the intensity to find the most, uh, uh, the most uh, uh, peak that face the, the most, we call it the most uh, yeah, peak young, uh, a, yeah, the main peak, huh? I want to find the main peaks. Okay, and uh, I want to see your absorption, uh, uh, UV, UV results. Yeah. Oh. Okay. Uh, can you please uh, explain? I mean, uh, what you were claiming about the absorption here. Uh, you were explaining something about the absorption of the material here a while ago. Absorption, absorption. Absorption, yes. Yeah. So what happened when you combine those? Uh, oh, the absorption is more uh, increasing in that. If you can see, as you can, if, if you all know that the O2 only absorb in the UV region. 
So uh, while mandarin carbide absorb in the UV until the visible light. So when the combination of the IO2 and mandarin carbide, it improves the region of absorption of the IO2 and also decrease the band gap of the IO2. So when you combine both, uh, both MO2 and TiO2, do you see any absorption in the visible region? Uh, yes. As because, you can see, the blue color. Because TiO2 is one of the photodetector application as well. So, I mean, if you, uh, we believe when we dope uh, MO2, it might create some of the defects in, in, the, in between the conduction and valence vein, and you can get some of the absorption in the visible range as well. Anyways, thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So, any more questions? Okay, uh, I have one question. Okay, why you are using the concentrations for the molybdenum, 3%? What happens if you increase the concentrations? Uh, okay, I've been tried 1, 2, 3 and 8 percent. So, uh, based on the photocurrent measurement, the 3 percent have the highest photocurrent. So, this is the method that I've been optimized to choose, whether 1, 2, 3 or 4 percent. So, 4 percent has reduced the photocurrent. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so thank you for uh, Miss Siti Nofalain. Okay, so now we proceed for the next presenter. Okay, Miss Noraini. Okay, so about, uh, doc, uh, because Dr. Aino will be the last presenter. Okay, so we invite Miss Noraini Binti Roslan from University Malaysia Terengganu. Okay, we'll present the effect of titanium bromide on the hydrolysis performance of the magnesium hydride system. Please welcome. Okay, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, my name is Nurani Mitiruslain and I'm from University of Malaysia Terengganu. So the topic that I will be pre presenting for today is the effect of titanium bromide on the hydrolysis performance of magnesium hydride system. Okay, so this will be the outline for today's presentation. Okay, uh, first and foremost, as we already know, uh, rapid growth in global energy demands has risen at an alarming rate. Therefore, hydrogen uh, as a secondary energy source is needed. However, hydrogen is bound to other elements to form compounds and it needs to be extracted or produced before it can be utilized. Uh, and one of the methods to produce hydrogen is through the hydrolysis of metal hydrides. Okay, so this is the energy consumption projection done by the Energy Information Administration. So um, they have predicted that by 2040, the global energy demand will increase up to 700 quadrillion BTU. BTU here stands for British Thermal Units. And in order to overcome this issue, alternatives such as uh, renewable energy sources is needed, like sunlight, wind, and geothermal. Okay, um, next, to fully utilize the renewable energy resources, an efficient energy carrier like hydrogen is needed. Why hydrogen is chosen? Because uh, hydrogen has high energy content. Hydrogen also um, a green energy carrier which produces water vapor as the combustion waste product. And lastly, hydrogen can be produced from the renewable energy sources. Okay, so these are several methods of hydrogen production from renewable sources. Okay, uh, some of the methods are high temperature water splitting, photobiological water splitting, electrolysis, fermentation, and metal hydride hydrolysis. So for today, I'll focus on the hydrolysis of, met of metal hydride which is magnesium hydride. 
Okay, so magnesium hydride will undergo surface modification and the addition of a catalyst in order to improve the hydrolysis kinetic properties. Okay, so magnesium hydride is chosen is because it it is able to hydrolyze at room temperature and the hydrogen production can exceed 1,703 milliliter per gram. And as for titanium bromide, it is a good catalyst for magnesium hydride compound based on the project of hydro solid state hydrogen storage. Okay, so for a problem statement, hydrolysis reaction of magnesium hydride can stop immediately due to the formation of magnesium hydroxide preservation layer on the magnesium particles, which can be shown here. The blue particles represented by the, um, magnesium hydroxide, which form on the surface of magnesium, that can stop the hydrolysis process, and thus it will reduce the hydrogen production capacity. Okay, so these are the literature review for this research. Uh, it is proven that by adding catalyst to the magnesium hydride system, it can increase the hydrogen production capacity. And by using catalysts that have bromide, uh, high hydrogen conversion yield is achieved in short time and at a low temperature. So these are the methodology. All the samples preparation uh, will be done in a glove box. This is to avoid contact with air and moisture. And for ball milling, it will be conducted for one hour. And after that, the hydrolysis process. And after hydrolysis, the pH reading will be taken and the samples will be filtered and dried to undergo characterization by using SRD. Okay, as for hydrolysis, uh, the apparatus set up for hydrolysis is as can be shown in the left side, which shows the three neck flasks, which has three openings. The first opening is for the installation, is for the injection of 10 milliliter of distilled water. The second opening is for the installation of tem temperature sensor. And the third opening is for the hydrogen gas outlet, which will be connected to a gas counter that has a data logger. Because this is a result for the hydrogen production. For pure magnesium hydride, it has the lowest hydrogen production, which is 101 milliliter per gram. <coughs> And for the milk magnesium hydride, it increased the hydrogen production by five times, which is 499 milliliter per gram. And the best results is recorded for magnesium hydride with the addition of 10 watt percent catalyst, which produced hydrogen for 1,118 milliliter per gram. Okay, so this is the SEM images for the samples. It shows that when adding catalyst to the samples, it has re effectively reduced the size of particles. So when the size of particles is reduced, it will increase the effective surface area for the hydrolysis to occur. For the pH measurement, the pH has reduced to 10.32 for samples with the addition of catalyst. So by lowering the pH, it's possible to prevent the formation of magnesium hydroxide preservation layer that inhibits the hydrolysis process. For the SRD, for example, before hydrolysis, it is to prove that the sample is pure before it can be used for the hydrolysis process. As we can see here, all the pigs belong to magnesium hydride and titanium bromide. And for the samples of after hydrolysis, uh, the SRD picks for pure MGH2 samples. We can see that there's still many peaks of magnesium hydride, and only one peak of magnesium hydroxide can be detected. This is due to the hydrolysis process that only occurs for a, sh a short time. And for the milk man magnesium hydride and magnesium hydride with the addition of catalyst, there's many peaks of magnesium hydroxide can be seen here because the hydrolysis process has occurred for a longer time and many hydrogen is released. So for the activation energy, this is the RNA exploit 
for the hydrogen yield for hydrogen system of magnesium hydride with 10 weight percent of titanium bromide. Okay, uh, the activation energy calculated was 41.65 kJ per mole. When we compare with the activation energy for magnesium hydride, it was reported as 58.06 kJ per mole. So, uh, for this, we have successfully reduced the activation energy. So, in a conclusion, the effect of ball milling was able to reduce the particle size and in return increase the effective surface area. And secondly, the addition of catalyst has, has reduced the pH of the solution where low pH can result in faster reaction kinetics. And last but not least, the activation energy has decreased to 41.64 kJ per mole with the addition of catalyst titanium bromide. These are my references. That's all from me. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you. So I open the questions from the floor. Uh, the activation energy is yeah, okay. Okay. Um, when the activation energy is lower, that's mean it needs uh, it, it, it activates what? What I mean, it activates to for what for what purpose? For what, what kind of formation? Uh, I also want to ask you, how do you relate activation energy to the energy energy of formation of mg mg H2. Uh, it doesn't form MGH2. MGOH. Uh, the one earlier you said that uh, around the magnesium is surrounded by MGOH. Uh, yes. Uh -huh. So, how do you read MGOH2, the formation of MGOH2, to the activation energy? Of okay, so when the MGOH preservation layer is formed on the MG surface, it will slow down the hydrolysis reaction. So when we use catalyst, it will break down the MGOH preservation layer. So it will, the, that means the activation energy will become lower. In yeah, so that's what I want to know. The relationship between the preservation state and the activation state. Uh, when the preservation layer has reduced. You need, uh, you need energy. To reduce that, you need energy. Oh, yes. Ah, okay. Uh, yes. <laughs> okay. Okay. Any more questions? Okay. Um, I have one question. Okay. Um, so when I, when you are using the titanium bromide, so what the properties from the titanium bromide that you want to uh, improve the magnesium hydride? I mean, uh, why you use titanium bromide? Instead of other element, um, I refer from the paper that use uh, zirconium bromide. They compare when they use zirconium bromide, zirconium chloride, zirconium hydride. So when I refer to the paper, the best result was recorded for the zirconium bromide. So I think I need to use the bromide components, which has a good effect to increase the hydrolysis performance. Okay, um, thank you. So, any more questions? Okay, if not, okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, Ms. Nurain. So, we go for the next uh, speaker, Ms. Nurain Nabilah binti Muhammad Noor, okay, from University Technology Mara. Okay, we'll present how about you approach on structural, electronic and optical properties. Please welcome. Test. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. <coughs> Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and good afternoon to everyone. So today I'm going to share about my project which is uh, entitled of Habit U Approach on Structural, Electronic and Optical Properties of Castrite and Stanite Phases CU2MNSNS4 from First Principle Study. Okay, 
Uh, as we know that the PV solar cell is, uh, there's many type of uh, solar cell, which is the first generation is from the wafer base. Uh, the, com the commercialized one is the crystalline silicon with the advantages of high quality, high efficiency. And then the second generation is from the tin film, as we know that uh, the cadmium telluride and the com copper indium gallium selenide with the advantages of the low cost than the first generation. And the third generation is come from the organic material like copper zinc tin sulfide, the SSC. Uh, among these three, I will focus on the third generation which is come from the copper zinc tin sulfide. Uh, okay. So the advantages of the tin film is the best production is simple and significantly reduced cost compared to the first generation. Okay, so basically the material that I propose to the, my project is the CMTS, U2 MNS SN4, which is a quaternary charcoal genetic semiconductor that contain in their structure and element of group 16. So where the CMTS come from is from the CIGS, the common uh, tin film solar cell, which the uh, indium and gallium were substitute to the zinc and tin. However, due to some drawbacks of uh, zinc and uh, zinc in the CZTS uh, material, so that uh, I propose to to substitute the zinc with the manganese, which the ionic radius of 0.80 Armstrong could be a suitable candidate to replace the zinc two plus and to reduce the cation disorder in CZTS. So. Uh, why CMTS? It is because the CMTS contain an abundance element, non-toxic, compared to the CIGS and cadmium telluride. Okay. Uh, the method that we use, that I use, is the computational method, the more way forward uh, compared to the experimental, because we do not need to synthesize and uh, we could uh, save time and raw material and also better understanding on, on how and why a product of a process is working. Okay. So what is the density in functional theory? It is a quantum mechanical method for solving the electronic Schrodinger equation of molecules and crystal using a formalism uh, based on the charge density rather than we use the wave function. So what is the Hubbard U approach? It is a, a method that we use to treat the strong on-site Coulomb interaction of localized electron, which is not currently described by the, by the standard DFT. So this is some uh, formulation that, we, uh, that is used for the uh, density functional theory, like strategic equation, consign formulation, and Hohenberg Cohn theorem. So this is Walter Hahn that uh, win the Nobel Prize in 1998 for the development in ten density functional theory. So basically, two uh, exchange correlation that we use in this uh, DFT, which is local density approximation and generalized gradient approximation. So this is the computational method, which is uh, the first step is I uh, model the structure, I'm modeling the structure for construct CMTS and standard CMTS for both structure. And then uh, we do the geometrical optimization to get the more suitable function to proceed with the next calculation and to validate with the experimental uh, value data. And then uh, we proceed with the running calculation to um, calculate the uh, properties for structural, electronic and optical properties. And then the data analysis. Okay, this is the result for, the, uh, for my material. So this two material is, uh, this is a crystal structure for Kestrat CMTS and standard CMTS, which is no much different. And uh, the latest parameter for both Kestra and Steinab CMTS using GGA PBE functional uh, is show a good agreement with the experimental data compared to the LDA and GGA PBE. So, so we can say that it validated and verified 
to the experimental, experimental value. Okay, next. This is the structural property from DFT plus U method. Uh, as we can see here, this is dependence of A and C parameter uh, and the volume uh, when we add the Hubbard U on the uh, our structure. So as we can see, as uh, the U value is increasing, uh, the, the lattice parameter is become bigger and for, move further away from the experimental value. So as we can so that we can conclude that uh, the standard DFT, the standard DFT is more uh, closer to the most close to the uh, experimental value. So this is the electronic properties on the bank gap after we add the uh, Hubbard U on the D orbital. So uh, we cannot find and we cannot we cannot get the uh, the bank gap is underestimated the experimental result which is 1.59 electron volt when the Hubbard U term UD applied to the both castrate and stannite. So to overcome this problem, we add the uh, Hubbard U on UD and UP side for both material. So the Hubbard U values that apply for Castrat CMTS up to 20 electron volt, while for standard CMTS is 16 electron volt. So as we can see here, the Castrat CMTS uh, needs more energy than the standard CMTS. Okay, this is the band structure. So the blue uh, band gap here is the standard DFT without Hubbard U. So there is no uh, band gap. Uh, the the uh, the band gap is overlap at the family level zero EV. And after the Hubbard U were uh, added, implemented, then the band gap will appear at the uh, lower conduction band of the. Uh, from the family level, which is uh, from the zero electron volt, we can get the uh, we can get the band gap to 1.59 electron volt. Uh, so this um, okay. can validate with the experimental value. So this is the set density of state, which uh, we can explain the orbitals that uh, occupy at the uh, uh, conduction band or the valence band. So from here, we can see that uh, by standard DFT, uh, there is overlap um, overlap uh, electron at the uh, Fermi level. While after the you apply, then there is uh, open gap or shifted uh, dose at the lower conduction band. So this is optical properties for dielectric function. So it is based on the response to the crystal to an external atrophic. So the static dielectric constant, epsilon naught of PBE, the standard DFT is much higher, is higher than the, uh, stand, the uh, PBE plus U, which is the DFT plus U uh, static dielectric constant. So uh, for the graph over there, uh, for the imaginary parts, yeah, which is can describe the electronic transition between the top and valence band, uh, there is a much of uh, peak. There is so many peak that that can be observed uh, to fr from the transition between impurities U three D, MN three D, and S three P state, which is this peak can explain the density of states. Okay, this is the opposite. Absorption coefficient, which is uh, my, uh, which is determine how far light up of a particle, particular wavelength can penetrate a material before it absorb. So from the absorption coefficient, the absorption is for both the FT plus U for the blue color and the green color uh, shift toward the shorter wavelength uh, region in the visible light, which is called blue shift while for the longer wavelength range in the visible light come from the standard CMTS for the red color one. However, uh, all the material here have the high absorption coefficient, uh, which is up to 10 power of 4 CM negative one. So for the conclusion, GJA PBE functional provides the best description of the structural properties. 
The band gap for both CMTS phases were successfully fixed from zero electron volt to 1.59 electron volt by implementing the, implementing the Hubbard U. And the most of the highest valence band for all phases consists of Cu3D, MN3D, and S3P states. And the lowest conduction band consists of SN5P and S3P states. And lastly, for the optical uh, properties, the absorption coefficient is up to 10 power of 4 cm negative 1. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you. So I open questions, Prof. I mean, your work is dealing with the, the, the condition of electrons. Yeah. Okay, you're talking about uh, non-interacting. This is a many-body interaction, see? Yeah. But you reduce it to uh, you represent that with uh, DFT. Yeah, density yeah. functionality. I mean, your DFT mean rep is representing the, the electrons. Is it correct? DFT? The amount of electrons in, this, in, in your system. Ah, yeah. And then you add on your hubbub. Yeah. Uh, and that hubbub, how does it arise? Uh, where, what is the mechanism of uh, energy required uh, to form uh, through, through you? And, and one more thing is electrons can be either localized or electrons can be itinerant. So in this uh, technique, which the, which, is it uh, the, the state of localized state or the itinerant state? Okay, uh, this is because of uh, the standard DFT uh, have the problem with the localized uh, D state orbital, uh, D state, so that the Hubbard U approach uh, used to to treat the the localized uh, of D and F orbital, so that it can make uh, uh, it can um, fix the uh, electronic part of the material. So as uh, as I explained before. Uh, from the standard DFT, I, I get uh, no bank gap for my material. So after we apply for the Hubbard U, then it can treat my, my uh, D, uh, D and F orbital so that we can see an appearing of bank gap uh, on my bank, uh, bank structure. Uh, so, uh, yeah. That's the answer. Let's say some materials yeah, show certain properties uh, as a function of temperature. As a function of temperature. At certain temperature, you can have this, uh, the, the shift or the transition from one phase to another phase. Mm -mm. So like this case, if you include, how do you include the temperature factors in, the, in your approach? Temperature factors. Yeah. Um, I'm, so like, like I'm working on superconductors. See? I see. And superconductors behave at, as a superconductor at around maybe 100 Kelvin. Okay. See? So if you do but this one, I do not see any uh, the role of temperatures uh, in the system. See? So um, for a superconductor, if you do that, we, we say that you're working. You, are, you do some calculation at room temperature, mm -mm. whereas it is not at room temperature, it's still a normal state. Mm -mm. But you want to go to the superconducting state, so how you want to include temperature into, the, into this kind of uh, simulation? Okay, uh, actually, <laughs> um, I'm not discovered yet for, uh, about the temperature, okay? Because we, we only run using the uh, software, so I did not, did not know about the temperature. But I will discover it later for you. Any other question? Okay, okay, one question. okay uh, so I hope this are uh, the last questions. Okay, uh, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Maybe I try to respond because this is the sharing session regarding to the question from the prof on the temperature. Actually, we can uh, set the temperature uh, using the thermodynamic <coughs> function. We can set uh, to calculate all the properties in terms of the, we can set the rate of temperature. 
from the what Kelvin to anti what Kelvin to see what the effect of the uh, material. Also, we can also can measure using the molecular dynamic, and then also we can calculate depend on the structure. For example, at a high temperature, the structure to tetragonal, we can calculate at the tetragonal part. We have a two or three way to uh, calculate uh, in terms of the temperature effect. Maybe we can share uh, with all of you here. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay. <clears throat> okay, thank you. Okay, so thank you to our uh, speaker. Thank you. Okay, so now we proceed to the last presenter for the sessions, okay, Dr. Aino Shirin Kamisan from the University Technology Mara. Okay, we'll present nickel cobalt hydroxide as potential electrode material for supercapacitor. Please welcome. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh to all uh, participants. Okay, um, today I want to share uh, our work about nickel cobalt double hydroxide prepared via electrode deposition as potential electrode material for supercapacitor. Okay, I'll go quick. <coughs> so, um, people are concerned about uh, fossil fuel uh, emission. Uh, fossil fuel uh, usage uh, affect the global warming and climate change. So we tend to uh, move to uh, renewable energies like hydropower, biomass energy, solar energy, geothermal energy, and wind energy. <coughs> but um, how we want to store this uh, type of energy? Okay, they goes to uh, energy. Uh, storage device okay um we can see here a uh, supercapacitor lies as a bridge uh, between the electrolytic capacitor which has a high power density and high energy density of fuel cell on and batteries also okay therefore um supercapacitor can be is is interesting um, energy storage device uh, uh, to be studied further. Okay. There are three types of supercapacitor, which is double layer capacitor, pseudo capacitors, and hybrid capacitors. Double layer capacitor use uh, activated carbon uh, and other type of uh, carbon derivatives uh, material, while Pseudo capacitors use uh, normally conducting polymer, metal oxides, and metal sulfides, and etc. Okay, hybrid capacitor is the combination between super uh, pseudo capacitor and electric double layer capacitors. Okay, uh, that's the uh, schematic uh, diagram of a uh, capacitor. Okay. Transition metal hydroxide supercapacitor. Typical transition metal oxide such as uh, ruthenium oxide, nickel oxide, cobalt oxide, and manganese oxide are all examined as superior supercapacitor electrode material. Ruthenium oxide has high specific capacitance, about 1,500 farad per gram, but ruthenium is very expensive. And nickel and cobalt based electrode are way more cheaper, plus uh, it uh, abundance. Okay. <coughs> nickel cobalt double hydroxide has higher cycle stability than pure nickel hydroxide. So, um, in this work, we focus on uh, developing nickel cobalt hydroxide electrode material for supercapacitor. Okay. Uh, first, we approach uh, 
so apa in designing nickel cobalt hydroxide supercapacitor by using density functional theory we want to um, es estimate what is the best ratio of nickel cobalt hydroxide uh, that can have best performance to our supercapacitor okay this is uh, the structural properties of nickel hydroxide so we use uh, several method of uh, DFT and we can see that uh, DGA PBE saw uh, method is the closest to the experimental value which is 3.143 for 37.539 volume okay so this method is choose to calculate other properties of nickel cobalt hydroxide uh, composition so okay this is uh, the structural properties uh, calculated by GGA PBE so uh, we have a uh, nickel to cobalt ratio 1 to 0 3 to 1 1 to 1 1 to 3 and 0 to 1 okay from this table we can see that uh, by adding cobalt to nickel hydroxide, uh, the volume of uh, nickel hydroxide increase because the cobalt hydroxide volume is larger as you can see uh, from the table. So this is the uh, band structure. You can see that um, by adding cobalt to uh, nickel, the electronic band gap uh, reduce. Uh, then and we get uh, the smallest uh, band gap at nickel to cobalt ratio one to three, two point two five seven electron volt. Okay, this uh, the density of state. Okay, according to quantum theory, only electrons near Fermi level can take part in electrical conduction. Okay, nickel cobalt hydroxide with nickel to cobalt ratio of one to three has highest total density of state, uh, around 18 electron volt among all compositions. Okay, the you can see that nickel to cobalt ratio one to three. We have uh, a peak uh, nearest to family level at the dotted line. Okay, so it has the highest uh, density of uh, electron there. Okay, uh, therefore nickel cobalt uh, hydroxide with nickel to cobalt ratio one to three has the highest electrical conductivity, and this may has the best electrochemical performance for our supercapacitor so um we also do the effect of uh, we also do the experimental part to prior uh, no after the we do the dft uh, calculation to prove that the uh, dft method is uh, reliable so uh, we do the one step electrodebulsion of nickel cobalt hydroxide with the uh, ratio uh, obtained from the DFT calculation. So if you can see um, the deposited uh, samples is uh, very thin because we only deposit uh, five minutes at negative uh, one milliamp ampere per cm square. Okay, this is the FTIR. The upper one is uh, nickel hydroxide, uh, nickel hydroxide uh, profile, and then the green one is the cobalt hydroxide. Uh, uh, the uh, cobalt hydroxide profile. Okay, the stretching uh, 
Cobalt Oxygen Band of Cobalt Hydroxide located at 670 cm can be seen shifted to 660, the green one. When the nickel cobalt ratio is 3 to 1, spectra due to nickel hydroxide characteristic band at 747, the attribute to nickel uh, oxygen band. So uh, this is proof that nickel cobalt hydroxide will successfully form. Okay, this is the uh, SEM micrograph at uh, low magnification because we want to see that um, the sample uh, is whether is the sample is well distributed or not. Okay, we can see that uh, nickel and cobalt are well distributed. Okay. And then uh, we can see that from the EDX, uh, the weight concentration is uh, similar to the electrolyte uh, nickel to nickel cobalt electrolyte uh, prepared to uh, prior to electrodeposition. Okay, this is the same image of the nickel cobalt hydroxide. Okay, you can see that all sample grow um, roughly perpendicular to substrate and cobalt grows on nickel. Okay, cobalt actually create pores like flower like pores at nickel cobalt one to three. This pause is to ease of charge transfer. Okay. This the um, cyclic voltammetry. Okay, the single redox peak uh, curve may be caused by the uniform doping of cobalt into hydro, uh, into nickel hydroxide. Okay, nickel cobalt one two three, the green one there. Okay, has the highest current response and largest under curve integrated area indicates the presence of synergistic redox uh, reaction leading to good electrochemical properties. Okay. This is the EIS. Nickel cobalt uh, 1 to 3 also has the smallest uh, semicircle. Uh, indicate that it uh, has small uh, charge transfer resistance. Okay, this is the uh, CV of uh, nickel cobalt hydroxide of different ratios. And then this is the geometric capacitance of uh, the supercapacitor. We can see that nickel to cobalt one to three has the highest uh, specific capacitance. The blue one, about one uh, zero point three three uh, farad per cm square. Okay, as conclusion, the optimal ratio of nickel cobalt for nickel cobalt hydroxide has been successfully determined by using density functional theory. The effect of cobalt ratio in nickel hydroxide on its electrochemical structural and morphological properties also investigated and proven that uh, nickel cobalt 1 to 3 is the best ratio for nickel cobalt hydroxide electrode as in the FT studies. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you. So I open questions. Okay, no question? Okay, let's go home. <laughs> okay, if there's no question, so I have uh, two questions. Okay, uh, first, um, from the slide bank cap, I think, doctor. So previous, you mentioned that nickel cobalt with the ratio 1-3 is the best, that which highest electrical conductivity. However, from the slide, your bank gap, so nickel cobalt is 3-1. Is it different? Uh, sorry, I, I can... Okay, so the previous, you mentioned nickel cobalt with the ratio 1-3 
uh -huh. has the highest electrical conductivity. Mm -hmm. However, from your slide, okay, mm -hmm. which is uh, bank gap, mm -hmm. so you mentioned nickel cobalt 3-1. 3-1? Yeah. Really? Is it different? <laughs> Three one 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 three, the smallest band gap has the. Uh, I think the next slide. Oh, okay. Uh, one one three. That one, the second one, three one. Three one. Nickel cobalt, yes. Nickel cobalt one three, has the highest uh, the city of state. The next slide, maybe. Next. Is it? No. Uh, this is the family label. Actually, if you can see, the nearest uh, peak at the family level is actually take part to the electrical conduction. So we can see that the nearest is here, about 18. And while uh, three one, even though is a uh, thirty, the the sit up. Eh, sorry. Okay, the peak at the family level, the nearest one is about ten, ten or twelve there. Three to one. So the highest. Uh, the city of state is the one to three ratio. Okay, thank you. Okay, so the last question is uh, how the ratio is determined? So how you determine the ratio between nickel and cobalt? How do the ratio? Uh, actually, uh, by some literature review. So then we apply the ratio uh, when you, we want to calculate the DFT. So you apply the ratio with the other element? Yep. Oh, okay. okay, thank you. Okay. Can I ask one question? Uh, yes. Oh. Okay. okay. Well, <coughs> interesting because uh, uh, this group have been using a lot of this density of states. Yeah? It's interesting. Yeah? <laughs> um, <coughs> because I, I'm, I'm concerned about, I'm, I'm concerned about, I'm not, I'm not familiar with Mm -hmm. Concern about the electron behavior in, in the density of states. Yeah? Again, I asked uh, earlier mm -hmm. whether the electrons are concerned with the localized electrons or the itinerant electrons. Yeah? Because at the room temperature, you have, you cannot have, you may have localized, but sure, you're going to have itinerant electrons. So does this affect the density of states? Or, or it doesn't matter? Whether you are itinerant or whether you are localized, you, you are put into one basket. Oh, okay. Thank you, Prof. Um, actually, uh, the FTA is calculation on the ground state level. Ground state level. Maybe I uh, can explain further about the uh, localized electron or what, because I am uh, experimental. Uh, person, <laughs> so I add the DFT on the surface level to uh, support my experimental. Maybe um, Dr. Faris has a better explanation in that. <laughs> to uh, respond to you, <laughs> I'm sorry, Prof. Okay, so any more questions? Okay, if uh, no questions, so thank you. Okay. <coughs> okay, so uh, ladies and gentlemen, so we have come to the end of the session. So I would like to thank all the speaker and audience for this fruitful, fruitful sessions. Okay, uh, so they have uh, one announcement. So please collect the certificate before the closing ceremony at 4 p.m. Okay, the certificate can be collected at the outside of this hall. Okay, so thank you for your attention. So, Assalamualaikum and good afternoon. Thank you.